Hello, I'm Lawrence and I'm on a quest to uncover all of the memos that Britain and America lost in the pond, and one of those memos pertains to the English language. In this case, American English. Now I'll be honest, you won't hear too many English people say what I'm about to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. American English is fascinating. And as a former linguistics student who once lived in Britain, I often felt compelled to defend it. You see, I've always been wary of groupthink. Groupthink is when a collection of individuals arrive at a consensus, even when it's at odds with the facts. I think the British tendency to ridicule American English might be spurred on by groupthink, but also British humour but also confirmation bias. To us, America is this big dog who likes to proclaim itself the greatest country in the world at the same time as policing it. Therefore, we think, it must be that this same hubris drove America to come up with new words and spellings. Why else do we suddenly remain silent when it's Australia referring to football as soccer? Indeed, the fact that the British came up with the word is often overlooked because in the heat of social media combat, this goes against our agenda. But having studied American English extensively, I'm amazed at how little this agenda holds up to scrutiny. Anybody who's seen my YouTube shorts can attest to that. To me, the story of American English, much like the story of language in general, is highly compelling. Some have even said the same thing about my videos, so if you haven't had a chance to subscribe, do that now. In the meantime, let's take a look at how we've been getting American English wrong, starting with this. Contrary to what you may have heard, a lot of American English is actually pretty similar to the English of my homeland, at least as it was in the 1600s. You see, it's been said that some present-day Americans actually talk a bit like how William Shakespeare might have spoken when he wasn't being portrayed by Ray Fiennes' brother. And I don't mean that Americans go around saying things like, How art thou, buddy? Would thyself care for a goblet of fair cores light? I mean that common properties of American English are closer to that of 17th century English people than they are to to those of the present day. When you think about it, this makes sense. The first successful permanent English settlement in America was in 1607, the same year Shakespeare completed Antony and Cleopatra. Perhaps the most notable characteristic that modern-day Americans share with early 17th century English people is roticity. Roticity specifically relates to the pronunciation of R. Most Americans today sound out the R in words like far, whereas most English people don't. However, back in 1620, England was rich with rhotic accents. Some actors of the time might even have articulated the R's in Wherefore art thou, Romeo? But even at that point in history, there were signs that rhoticity in England was beginning to crack. Playwright Ben Jonson, a contemporary of Shakespeare's, noted in the 1630s that the letter R sounded firm in the beginning of words and more liquid in the middle and ends. I don't he probably didn't have that accent. More than a century later, it was disappearing so fast among speakers in London that Americans returning to England after the Revolutionary War noticed its absence. And the decline of England's roticity has even continued on during my own lifetime, with the fire pronunciation today largely confined to the West country. Meanwhile, in America, just as in Scotland and Ireland, the post-vocalic R is stronger than ever. But this doesn't mean that it hasn't been tested. In the 18th and 19th centuries, several port cities with commercial ties to Britain were influenced by England's newfound R-less pronunciation, to the extent that some people in, say, Boston and Savannah still pronounce it far today. And up until World War II, non-roticity was a common feature of America's mid-Atlantic accent, a prestigious way of talking talking among actors and broadcasters during the early 20th century. But on the whole, the same linguistic transformation witnessed in England did not occur in the US. Before I actually moved to the United States, I'm not sure I realised the extent to which our two countries differed on one thing in particular. Homophones. A homophone is when two or more words are pronounced the exact same way but possess a different meaning, and sometimes spelling. One example of my own is how I identically pronounce poor as in downpour, and poor as in my dog's paw. Doggy. In the United States, roticity means that this particular homophone is highly uncommon, with poor and pa highly distinct. Instead, many of the homophones I've encountered in America were the result of phonetic mergers in which cot and court developed the same pronunciation in some regions. Moreover, approximately 57% of Americans make no phonetic distinction between the three M words in the following sentence. George wished to marry Mary while he was married. 
Harry. Imagine the wedding speech is seven pints in. Often when debates arise over British versus American English, a common British retort is this. We invented the language, so our way is correct. But that retort ignores the fact that English was technically created by Germanic people 1500 years ago. It also conveniently overlooks the fact that English borrowed heavily from countless other languages like French, Latin or Arabic. And one thing that I've seen repeatedly while making shorts on the topic is this. American alterations are often made precisely with these origins in mind. I mean, sure, Versailles, Indiana might not sound too much like the French palace that inspired it. But then, you know, if there's one area in which Americans make up their own rules, it's place names. However, given the UK existence of Worcester, Chiswick and... I can't remember how to say that. The two countries might have cause for common ground. But very often, everyday Americanisms, like the spelling of licorice, won out because they more closely match the older words from which they were derived. In many ways, it has less to do with getting one over the British and more to do with injecting consistency into an otherwise inconsistent language. Neither country comes remotely close to realising that dream, but I applaud Americans for trying. From experience, it's difficult to comprehend all of the regional nuances of American English without actually living here. In fact, I've been told by plenty of Americans quite believably that the same is true of Britain. The problem is, when you're commenting from afar, all you've got to go on is what you hear in film and television. And the problem with that is that both seem to create an illusion that between them, Britain and America share about six dialects. In reality, rough estimates put the number of combined major dialects at around 70. I was not surprised to discuss that more than half of them came from Britain, where you can barely drive 50 miles before hearing a new word for chewing gum. But younger me would have been stunned to learn that the United States is home to more than 30 major English dialects of its own, not to mention countless sub-dialects. Of course, in such a large country, this means that you might drive hundreds of miles before encountering major differences in the way people speak. But there are many exceptions to this rule. Take, for example, North Carolina, proclaimed by some to be the most linguistically diverse state in the Union. In fact, in addition to the dialects of Virginia Piedmont, North Carolina Piedmont, African American Vernacular English, North Carolina Coastal Plains, and Southern Appalachian Highlands, there's the curious case of High Tide English. Spoken by only a couple of hundred people when you hear it, something peculiar stands out. It almost sounds... British. Hi. Oi toyed on the south side, high tide on the south side. In fact, the BBC perhaps described it best in 2019. It's like someone took Elizabethan English, sprinkled in some Irish tones and 1700 Scottish accents, then mixed it all up with pirate slang. They don't, they don't speak like that on the BBC anymore. And that more or less describes the origins of high tide, or as speakers of it might say, hoi toyed, because, well, that, I mean, they sound like they're from Birmingham. <laughs> When we think of words that the United States gave to the English language, we often think of expressions we perceive as tired or overused. This can include words like awesome, even though Britain both uses it and introduced it. But the more I've looked into this, the more I've realised something unexpected. America is responsible for thousands of very common words that us Brits use without hesitation. Words like hello, okay, hangover, belittle and teenager. And one common denominator between many such words is that upon entering the language in centuries past, they were soundly ridiculed by the British. In the case of belittle, a word coined by US President Thomas Jefferson, there's even recorded evidence for such a backlash. Belittle? What an expression! It may be an elegant one in Virginia, but for our part all we can do is to guess at its meaning. For shame, Mr. Jefferson. So what does this tell us? It tells us that distrust of other forms of English is nothing new. But it also tells us that Brits will lampoon Americanisms until we collectively forget that that's what they are. It's quite probable that the American origins of, say, Caesar to mean series, itself a recent addition to British English, will one day be lost to history. And speaking of history, English is a language more than 1500 years in the making. Along the way, words have come and gone, definitions have changed, and spellings have evolved beyond recognition. So just know that this will happen again, and that blame, if you want to call it that, will never solely rest on American shoulders. Unless we're talking about the word addicting. What is going on with that? If you haven't had a chance to watch my YouTube shorts, begin your binge by clicking here next. And until the next video, goodbye.